her. Thank you, Father, that the thing that we see most of all is that she loves you and that she's committed to your glory. She's committed to the gospel. And we pray that as she shares with us this morning, as she reads the Bible and explains it, that you would deeply, deeply speak to each one of us now. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, it's great uh, to be back in Willowfield again. Um, I have to say, it's never easy coming back to places where you've really uh, been deeply involved in people's lives and then had to be pulled out of that. But like having a sticking plaster taken off um, that was particularly sticky and painful. Um, but I'm so glad to be here. Um, so thank you, Clive, for asking me uh, to come back. I've got a couple of readings this morning. Um, and the first one is from Deuteronomy chapter 8, and you'll find that on page 152 of your Pew Bible. And most of what I'm going to share this morning actually comes from this text. For the Lord your God is bringing you into a good land, a land of brooks, of water, of fountains and springs, flowing out in the valleys and hills, a land of wheat and barley, of vines and fig trees and pomegranates, a land of olive trees and honey, a land in which you will eat bread without scarcity, in which you will lack nothing, a land whose stones are iron and out of whose hills you can dig copper and you will eat and be full and you shall bless the Lord your God for the good land he has given you. Take care lest you forget the Lord your God by not keeping his commandments and his rules and his statutes which I command you today lest when you've eaten and are full and have built good houses and live in them and when your herds and flocks multiply and your silver and gold is multiplied and all that you have is multiplied, then your heart will be lifted up and you'll forget the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery, who led you through that great and terrifying wilderness with its fiery serpents and scorpions and thirsty ground where there was no water, who brought you water out of the flinty rock, who fed you in the wilderness with manna that your fathers did not know, that he might humble you and test you to do you good in the end. Beware lest you say in your heart, my power and my might of my hand have gained me this wealth. You shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you power and to get wealth, that he may confirm his covenant that he swore to your fathers as it is this day. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And we're going to turn over to, to Corinthians. And I have a, a short thought that I'm going to share for this, but I'll, I'll just read this out uh, for now. Very familiar uh, title, The Cheerful Giver, 2 Corinthians chapter 9, uh, beginning at verse 6. The point is this. He ever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and he ever sows bountifully will also reach, but reap bountifully. Each one must give as he decides in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver, and God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. As it is written, he has distributed freely, he has given to the poor, his righteousness endures forever. He who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way to be generous in every way, which through us will produce thanksgiving to God. For the ministry of this service is not only supplying the needs of the saints, but is also overflowing in many thanksgivings to God. By their approval of this service, they will glorify God because of your submission that comes from your confession of the gospel of Christ and the generosity of your contribution for them and for all others. While they long for you and pray for you because of your surpassing grace of God upon you, thanks be to God for his inexpressible Amen. Harvest is that wonderful time of gathering for farmers and market gardeners. It's a time of gathering crops. And for us as Christians, 
It's a time when we gather together like today as a church family to celebrate God's goodness, to celebrate God's abundant, exuberant generosity and provision for us, and to praise him for all that he has given and for all that he is doing, and just for who he is, that he's God, he's our God. I don't tend to preach from the Old Testament much, but this reading from Deuteronomy is really appropriate for Harvest Thanksgiving, specifically those verses 7 to 9, which speak of the good land, a land of abundance that God was going to give his people, and how they're to praise him in response. Two times the people are warned to take care lest they forget that it is the Lord their God who provided for them, who protected them on their journey to this place of abundance. That book of Deuteronomy is a series of farewell sermons by Moses. And in this particular sermon, in just 12 verses, Moses describes God five times as the Lord your God. In verses 7 to 9, he calls the people to remember the God who abundantly provides for them is their God. He says, you're to bless or praise the Lord your God for such incredible provision verse 10. Obedience to God's commands is evidence that you've not forgotten the Lord your God, verse 11. Moses says, don't forget the Lord your God, God, verse 14, who rescued you from slavery, led, fed, and protected you through the wilderness. And in verse 18, commands them to remember it's the Lord your God who gives you power to get wealth. I'm going to come back to those verses at the end. But it does remain true for us today that in our abundance and prosperity, we can easily forget that God is the giver of every good and perfect gift. We forget to give thanks for what he has given to us. Many of you know that I lived in Ethiopia for a number of years, and the Ethiopians I lived alongside taught me a lot. One of the things they taught me was to be thankful maybe because they're poor, maybe because of repeated drought and repeated disasters. They're quick to thank God for the food they have, for a drink of water, for a cup of coffee. One of the downfalls of living in a society uh, that is so wealthy is that we tend to think that we have power to provide for ourselves, that God is not at work providing for our each and every need. This reading reminds us that the Lord, our God, provides for our needs day by day. I wonder where we are on this whole issue. Have we forgotten that God is providing for us? Do you feel that God isn't providing adequately for you, or maybe in a way that you would have hoped? It's good to talk to God about our fears. If we're worried that God will not provide in an area of our lives, we can bring every worry to God. But today, the Bible reminds us that God does provide. We sometimes think our homes, our salaries, the food, drink, and clothing in our cupboards from our, our, comes from our own efforts. We work hard to get things in our own strength. But that's not what Moses is saying here. The Bible says, Father God abundantly provides. And our only response is to bless him, to remember to praise him, and to give thanks to him. I'd like to pause for a moment and, and just remember God's exuberant generosity to us. At one of our Holy, uh, Holy Week prayer stations uh, this year, we had um, a gratitude jar, and this is it. I brought it along. I knew it was going to come in useful at some point, so I didn't throw it out. People took time during that very special week to think about what God had given them and to, to want to write down and say thanks to him in it. We used Psalm 9 as a, a, a prompt for us. I'll give thanks to you, Lord, with my whole heart. I'll tell of all your wondrous deeds. I'll be glad and rejoice in you. I'll sing the praise of your name, O Most High. So here are a few examples as we prompt to you of what people said they were thankful for that particular week. Family, friends, the church, my faith. 
health and strength. I thank God. Thank you for fulfillment at work. Thank you for the blessings of health and strength and peace in your presence. You get the idea? And I want us to do that now. I really do think that uh, God wants us to give thanks to him. So why not think about your past week, maybe the past month, or even the year since last harvest? What has God given that you are very grateful for and thankful for today? How has he been working in your life? How has he been working in the life of the Willowfield Church family? What prayers has he answered? And what blessings have you known? And just in the quiet now, we're going to say thank you to God. It might take us a wee while. We might have a big, long list. But let's just do that. Let's just say thank you to God. Father, we will give thanks to you with our whole hearts. I believe something supernatural happens when we are thankful. Psalm 100 verse 4 says, Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. When we take time to thank God for the things he's given us, somehow that veil between heaven and earth gets drawn back and we are right in God's presence. That's what the Bible says, isn't it? Enter his gates with thanksgiving. At our contemporary services in Maharali, we have a, a thing we call the church family slot, when members of our church family share how God's been working in their lives. And one of them recently shared how writing down three things every morning as he begins his day has really helped him to deal with anxiety. He shared how for years he would feel overwhelmed by work or family stuff to the point where he really was immobilized and he couldn't think straight. But a sermon he heard preached on Philippians 4 changed things for him. We're familiar with the verse, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. It was that word, thanksgiving, that jumped out to him that morning. And it started him on a daily practice of reading his Bible, considering and then writing down three things that he's thankful for, and then having a talk with God about that. He's no longer an anxious man that he was. And I commend this practice to you to begin every day with, thankful, with thankfulness. And God will be true to his word. He will come and presence himself with you. He will come and keep you company. The rest of that verse says, and the peace of God will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. And it's the peace of his presence that just comes and settles us when we're thankful. And sometimes when life throws the hard stuff at us, the odd curveball, we still need to be thankful, don't we? It's that sacrifice of praise we bring to him on those days. Moses commands the people of Israel to remember that the God, the Lord, is their provider. To remember is not to forget God. It's more than a mental activity. It involves our behavior too. In the wilderness, the people depended on God for absolutely everything. And now in this land of plenty, their self-confidence has led them to think that they did it all for themselves and they've become self-reliant. In Ethiopia, I never would have driven anywhere without first praying. The roads were that wild. And I never really sat down to eat anything either without giving thanks to God. Now, sometimes it was what we called doulet there or tripe. And I was praying that God would help me swallow it. But most of the time, it was fabulous traditional food. 
here in Ireland, it's so easy to just start eating our breakfast, our lunch, our dinner without thanking God. It's easy for us to act as if God doesn't exist. But he is the living God, and he is at work fulfilling his purposes for each of us in each of our lives day by day, fulfilling his purposes in his world. In that New Testament reading, Paul says, having an abundance of everything, you are to share abundantly in every good work. Ethiopians are incredibly generous. Many of them are poor, but they share what they do have. Their stuff is not grasped tightly as their stuff, but it's held lightly. When I was learning um, Harak, I used to go and practice on poor people in a, a project uh, where I would go around houses um, and try to ask questions about the children, usually about their vaccination status. And it was just to try to get me into conversation with people. And one of the homes I visited, I'm never going to forget. It had, uh, it was a, a pretty poor home and there was a little boy inside it and he had a really deep cut on his arm and there was a lot of green pus in it. And being a, a good uh, kind of uh, missionary, I had a wee rucksack on my back and inside it there were some wipes and uh, dressings and, and a bottle of water and stuff. So I took all that out and I just sat there uh, in my best Amharic explaining that I was cleaning the wound to his mummy and I put on a nice clean dressing that I had with me. And then I finished by putting a couple of dressings and a few alcohol wipes in a little Ziploc bag. And in my best Amharic, I told this wee mummy, in three days time, you change that dressing. Just do exactly what you saw me doing. And that lady, in response to me doing that, opened uh, a wee cupboard in her room. She had to first dig way down deep inside her clothing to find out a little key uh, that was on a piece of string. And she opened a tiny little cupboard about the size of a bathroom cabinet. And inside was a little rolled up uh, cone of um, tea leaves and another little rolled up cone of sugar and another tiny little cone of tea spices. And she started to make me tea over a little charcoal burner. I remember that as being the best cup of tea I've ever had in my life. And I have had afternoon tea at the Merchant and at the Galgon. But that tea was given to me by someone who was exuberant in sharing what she had. She just poured it out. It was the best she had to offer. And the two of us just sat and drank a wee cup of tea together. It was very, very special. I've been thinking to myself as I was preparing to preach today, when was the last time that I gave that really cost me? Now, I tithe. I do alms. I give to other organizations on top of my tithing. But when was the last time it cost me? I give out of my abundance. I give out of my wealth. That lady gave me everything. You know, it was what she had. Giving should be costly. We could really learn, I think, from Ethiopians and others who give in such generous ways. Because as our reading from Corinthians says, God loves a cheerful giver. Our giving should never be forced or grudging, but rather voluntary generous and exuberant. Verse 6 says, a stingy planter gets a stingy crop. A lavish planter gets a lavish crop. I believe this applies to every aspect of our lives. When we give to the Lord, he multiplies. He multiplies our time, our gifts, our ambitions, our money. And Clive's been telling me about your here to stay project and how God is already turning around your financial situation and providing for church running costs, the building project. He's adding more people to this amazing church family. I've heard you've got four new life groups. How fabulous, how good is our God? Keep going. Be lavish and exuberant in your giving, giving that really costs because God will make that here to stay project thrive. 
finally. I mentioned that the phrase, the Lord your God, is repeated five times in these verses from Deuteronomy 8. And when God repeats words and phrases in Scripture, it means he's trying to get our attention. Some of you know that my sister Helen went to be with Jesus this year, and her death has triggered this real urgency in me for us to think about our eternal destiny. Where will we spend eternity? Our Helen loved the Lord. She was a worship leader. She led discoverers and Christian endeavor and served as their treasurer for years. Not because she was fabulous and faithful, although she was, but because he is worthy. And I know she's now enjoying the mere presence of the Lord Jesus because of all that he has done for us on the cross. What about you? Is the Lord your God? Do you believe in the Lord Jesus? Do you love him? I'm confident that none of us wants to stand condemned and excluded from God's presence for eternity. So can I urge you as we are in this beautiful church with evidence of God's generosity and provision all around us, that if you haven't yet opened your heart to God to believe in the Lord Jesus, that you would do that today. Romans 10 verse 9 says, if we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, we will be saved. You might want to open your hand to God this morning as a sign that you are opening your heart to him, that you're opening up your life to him so you can be generous with what he's given you. And now silently we can open our mouths in the quietness of our hearts and just say, Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. Shall we pray? Father God, thank you for the indescribable gift of your son, Jesus. Thank you for your love and grace demonstrated by his death on the cross. I'm sorry for my mess. Please, will you forgive me? Please, will you come, Lord? Will you forgive each of us? Will you forgive the mess we've made? Will you come into the chaos that's our, lo our lives and be Lord? Will you help us to be generous in sharing what we have and to always be thankful for all that you've done? To always be thankful for who you are, the Lord our God. Amen.